Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another awesome guest today uh, who has been involved in his entire career and continues to help create a better tomorrow for so many people out there via his work. Uh, today, we are uh, have the honor of being joined by uh, Dr. Stanley Plotkin, uh, physician, scientist, widely acknowledged godfather of vaccinology who uh, back in the 1960s downtown here in Philadelphia while at the Worcester Institute uh, played a pivotal role in the discovering of the uh, rubella a virus vaccine, a key component of the MMR vaccine today, uh, and has worked extensively over the years on the development uh, and the application of a wide range of other vaccines, including polio, rabies, uh, varicella, rotavirus, and CMV. Uh, Dr. Plotkin graduated from uh, NYU 1952. He got his medical degree, Downstate Medical Center in Brooklyn, uh, and was a resident in pediatrics at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and at the Hospital for Sick Children in London. Uh, in 1957, uh, he joined the uh, Epidemic Intelligence Service for the CDC, uh, part of the U.S. Public Health Service, um, and then ultimately transitioned in 1960. Uh, to be a member of Worcester's uh, active research faculty. Uh, and today, in addition to his uh, emeritus appointment at Worcester, he's also emeritus professor of pediatrics at Penn uh, and works as a consultant advising uh, vaccine manufacturers, biotech firms, nonprofits, uh, and governments. Uh, his book, Vaccines, uh, remains the standard reference on the subject. And he is also the editor of uh, uh, Clinical and Vaccine Immunology, published by the American Society of Microbiology. Uh, he's also an accomplished pilot on top of all of that. Uh, a lot to discuss uh, in the ensuing couple of years since we last chatted, but Dr. Stanley Plotkin, uh, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the show. Uh, you're welcome. Um, Stanley, you know, the last time we chatted was about uh, two years ago uh, at the very beginning of the COVID pandemic. Um, at the time, we had we had diagnostics, obviously social distancing and masks and all that stuff. Uh, no vaccines at the time. Um, and I was just I was just listening to a show with uh, your colleague, my neighbor around the corner here, Paul Offit, uh, sort of describing the last couple of years as uh, apropos of the, the airplane analogy, sort of flying an airplane and building it at, at the same time. Um, I would love to hear sort of your report card from the last couple of years since we last chatted on just in general, how things have gone, how you see things, what we could have done better, what what you're glad we did, uh, fill us in a little bit on the last two years, uh, specifically as it pertains to COVID and Stan Blatkin. Well, so um, the last two years have been a mixture of good and bad. Um, and my bottom line is that um, we have succeeded in preventing a disaster. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, we have not succeeded in um, uh, in eradicating a disease which has caused a great deal of mortality and, and morbidity. So in a sense, uh, the virus has fought us to a draw. And um, so let me uh, go back and, and say why I believe that. Um, First of all, of course, as many have uh, remarked, uh, vaccine development was accelerated to a, a degree never seen before. Uh, that is, uh, we went from no vaccine 
uh, to um, a couple of vaccines uh, within the, a year of the appearance of this new virus called SARS-2 or um, you know coronavirus. Um, so th- that that was certainly uh, a positive. Uh, however, uh, I frequently have to remind people that the ability to develop uh, in particular, the messenger RNA vaccines was the product of uh, at least 20 years of prior d- development. So, um, uh, you know, vaccines don't spring from from the head of, of uh, Jupiter uh, mm-hmm. like Athena. They are the product of many years of basic uh, science. And that was certainly the case with the messenger RNA vaccines that by and large have been the best vaccines against this uh, new, new disease. So that, that was a uh, uh, very positive, uh, of course. And messenger RNA vaccines are now being developed for many other diseases. And we will see soon uh, just how widely we can apply uh, the messenger RNA uh, technology. Um, I should point out, though, that one uh, defect of the messenger RNA technology, which so far has not been solved, uh, is duration of the immune response. Um, so the um, to be, to be more specific, the um, stimulation of uh, T cells seems to be rather good and and permanent, but the stimulation of B cells, that is the induction of memory mm-hmm. in B cells, is not so good, and this is a problem that. Um, uh, that must be solved if we're going to um, be able to use these vaccines without repeated uh, boosters. Um, but the the second aspect is the prevention of infection as well as disease. And I think what we can say is that the the most immunogenic vaccines are. Uh, uh at uh, short periods after immunization are okay as far as preventing infection but on the other hand uh, with time that ability decreases and overall the messenger rna vaccines have certainly not eradicated or um, decreased the, the circulation of the uh, coronaviruses so that that's that's a problem that that needs to be solved um so uh, when i said before that um, i think the situation is a draw uh, at the time to- at this time what i mean is that we have vaccines that by and large can prevent mortality serious morbidity uh, and prevent uh, an epidemic from destroying society. Mm-hmm. So that that's certainly a positive. But on the other hand, we have not been able, as let's say in the case with polio or measles, we have not been able to really reduce the circulation of the virus. And and of course, uh, I should have pointed out the the one of the important reasons for this is the ability of SARS to to mutate so that uh, whatever protection we have against prior uh, variants of, of the virus tends to disappear or at least much reduced uh, when the virus uh, mutates so that that's why I say uh, metaphorically, that we've come to a draw with mm-hmm. with the virus. That is, we we on the positive side have prevented the virus from destroying society, that's and that's good. not tri- trivial. <laughs> no. 
but on the other hand, uh, we have not been able uh, in any way to eradicate uh, the virus and um, uh, prevent the uh, societal disruption that it is still call, uh, causing. I'll stop there. Stan, when we when we last talked, you know, a couple of years ago, you you introduced um, us at the time to the theme of uh, of a challenge study, which I guess for yes. a very novel virus at the time was it wasn't the right time. Since then, um, I know you and um, Art Kaplan have have, have recently published uh, uh, human in human vaccine immunotherapeutics. Uh, talking about the urgent need to lay the groundwork for possible future challenge studies per, in that case, the South African variant. Uh, then there was also an article I read uh, where you were talking about this in, in MedPage in November, talking about uh, human challenge trials as pertains to the development of novel pan-coronavirus vaccines. Uh, could you reintroduce us to the theme of a challenge study and why now is a much more opportune time to sort of revisit this tool for potentially broader eradication of this thing. Right. Okay. So um, first, let me say that the idea of challenging humans with a virus that can cause uh, disease uh, is not a new one. I, I, I think it's important to emphasize that, that yep. over many years, challenge studies uh, have been done. Now, of course, Whenever one does a um, an infection of a human with a, a purposeful infection, uh, one has ethical issues, and and one of course wants to avoid causing harm uh, to um, uh, to the volunteers, uh, and that is still uh, a a key point, and I want to emphasize that that any challenge study has to be done after considerable reflection and ethical discussions. Uh, in other words, uh, to be sure that you're not going to permanently uh, damage uh, the volunteer uh, mm -hmm. who was agreeing to, to be infected. Uh, fortunately, with SARS-2, in young, healthy people, uh, we have um, uh, a good deal of of safety in the sense mm -hmm. that it is unlikely that a young, healthy individual is going to be permanently or seriously damaged uh, by um, infection with with, with a um, uh, with, with the, the virus that, mm -hmm. we, uh, that we all know, SARS two. Um, and again, I want to repeat that human challenges with other viruses have been done over the years in, in literally in thousands of people, of volunteers. Yeah. And the um, figure, which I believe I'm correctly remembering, is that the incidence of severe or uh, uh, unexpected um consequences is 0.2 percent mm -hmm. uh, that is summarizing all, all those studies so uh coming back to sars uh, 2 uh obviously as as i said before we don't have a, a perfect vaccine in the sense of a vaccine that will uh, prevent infection um uh, in, a, in a regular way, that is in, in the vast majority of, of vaccinees. We, we have vaccines that protect them against uh, serious disease. So, uh, and, and we have a virus that's mutating all the time. And so we want uh, a vaccine that is broadly protect, protective. Well, so under those circumstances, I believe, and others, at least some others, agree with me, that one way of uh, accelerating the development of vaccines that will broadly protect is to show with the challenges of human volunteers that they are protected against 
uh, a range of viruses, that is the, the ones that are circulating uh, largely, and that they prevent infection as well as uh, symptoms. And um, to that end, uh, we have a, a new vaccine institute in, um, in uh, Belgium, mm-hmm. uh, which um, <laughs> um, I, I have to mention uh, uh, bears my name as well as uh, the European uh, Vaccine Institute. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea there, among other things, I mean, not just challenge studies, but the idea there is to house volunteers and to do studies with uh, various coronaviruses uh, using uh, testing vaccines that are being developed now in the hope of having a vaccine that will prevent not only um, the original coronavirus, but the, but the the mutants, the variants that are occurring now, and uh, uh, coronaviruses that are still in bats, uh, but who but which could come out of bats into humans at mm-hmm. you know tomorrow, right. as, uh, for all all we know. So I think those human challenge studies are extremely important in developing broad vaccines that hopefully will will um, be highly effective against variants that we have already and any new variant that may come down the road. Excellent, excellent. Um, Stan. Last week, uh, the vaccine-related biologics products advisory committee for the FDA met January 26 to uh, simplify, standardize the uh, um, the I guess the, the bivalent booster into sort of the standard per a potential um, annual immunization schedule. Um, can you say a few words about? I mean, I about your perspective on the FDA meeting on, on sort of the decisions, particularly on this front. And, you know, obviously we're, you know, it's becoming more like the annual flu uh, in terms of its schedule and the way things are going to be happening, but mm-hmm. your perspective on, on, on sort of that activity, if you would. Yes. Well, it's a logical activity. It's one that, you know, there's been bandied about and discussed, for some time now, it's not really a new idea. The right. CDC may be getting around to it, but uh, a lot of us have have been talking about, well, we will need bivalent vaccines, that is to say, uh, influenza and uh, coronavirus to, together, um, which will, you know, will, will require some basic work by vaccine manufacturers, but it's not a not a stupid idea. It's 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 sort of an obvious thing that we have two respiratory viruses that are most active during the winter, and it's logical that one would immunize against them, presumably in the autumn of um, of each year. Um, the 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 problem both for influenza and for uh, coronaviruses is they change so quickly. They mutate so quickly. And uh, it's no secret that our influenza vaccines are not anywhere near 100% effective. Um, Because even during a season, the, the virus, influenza virus can change. And the same thing is true of coronavirus. Mm-hmm. That being said, the vaccines do do a pretty good job in preventing serious disease, that is, uh, death and hospitalization. So um, getting an annual vaccination is clearly a good idea. Uh, Now, whether the public can be convinced about that remains to be seen. That's unfortunately a new issue that's uh, that's developed but um 
I, I, I foresee a, a recommendation uh, eventually, that is after the manufacturers uh, can do their, their job, I, I can foresee a recommendation that would entail uh, the production of new vaccines each year and a combined influenza coronavirus vaccine being given in the autumn as uh, we do today with influenza. In um, June of 2022, Stan, uh, you um, gave a sort of the keynote at the uh, New York Academy of Sciences uh, Future of Vaccinology Conference. Um, and I had right afterwards, I had Emilio Mini on the show. I asked what you guys were going to discuss. And he said, ask Dan Plotkin. So uh, I'm going to ask you. Um, what, what did you discuss at the uh, New York Academy of Sciences? And then obviously the, this paper came out afterwards in clinical infectious diseases, why we need persistent vaccinology. And, and you go into sort of the history and and some of, you know, sort of the, the use of these tools that are better at it, ca characterizing antigens and uh, ultimately the definition of the, the proper correlates. Um, in addition to the mRNA, um, what what gets you excited as far as some of these new tools? What are you looking forward to? What tools concern you? Um, take us a little bit out into the future, potentially some of what you're looking at at the new institute. Yes, well, um, I, I guess I should start by saying that vaccinology, when I started many years ago, was sort of a, a, a rump uh, part of, um, of uh, microbiology. That is, um, it, it was something that was done without a lot of basic science. Uh, and so, you know, we all remember Pasteur's rabies vaccine that was developed almost by accident. And um, what I've witnessed is the development of vaccinology as a, a science, of course, based on microbiology, uh, based on uh, structural biology, um, uh, based on biochemistry. Uh, it, it, it has really become a science on, on its own. Now, um, We've we we just talked about the coronavirus uh, vaccines and the importance of messenger RNA. Sure. Uh, I should uh, point out that um, years ago, actually in the 1990s, that people began to say, "Well, our vaccines are based on proteins," yeah. but what about using the nucleic acids that code for the proteins? Mm -hmm. That work was done both on DNA and RNA. Uh, the, uh, and both of those approaches are still being used. That is to say, we can now develop a vaccine based, uh, for example, on a DNA virus uh, by using the, the DNA to inoculate intradermally and to mm -hmm. generate an, an immune response. Um, and that works. And it's actually uh, has been licensed for veterinary, some veterinary vaccines. Um, it has not yet been licensed for, uh, for humans, uh, but that um, has involved mainly the problem that you need a uh, sort of a, a way of introducing it into the skin. And, and so you need this kind of machine to do that. And anyway, but, but the point is that DNA vaccines work. Um, but then, as, as we know, uh, again, starting in the 90s, uh, the question of could you use a messenger RNA was, uh, was asked. And after 20 years of work, it was shown that, yes, you could uh, do that. And so we have the messenger of RNA vaccines. Um, but the, the messenger RNA vaccines code for 
molecules that um, are in a way relatively simple and that uh, that are seen the, the the message RNA produces a protein that is seen by the immune system the immune system uh, responds to that but the formation of the protein is a key issue uh, and the the messenger RNA v- vaccines don't specify the the structure of the protein that is being produced. And so it's been realized in uh, recent virology that uh, when you produce a protein um, in, let's say, in cell culture, uh, just producing the amino acids and stringing them together doesn't necessarily give you a good molecule as a vaccine because structure matters. Right. It's not just the the string of amino acids. It's just how those amino acids produce a structure, a protein. And so it, it is now, uh, the, the goal now is to uh, produce a protein structure that is close to the natural structure in that the virus produces or that the cells produce uh, rather than just a string of amino acids. And um, uh, in particular, uh, the example of a virus called respiratory syncytial virus uh, is an important example. That is a virus secondary, second only to influenza as uh, an important respiratory virus, virus, both in infants and in the elderly. And the vaccines developed against that virus have not worked mm-hmm. until it was realized that they're not working because you're, you're not making the, the natural protein. You're making a, you know, an unnatural protein that's mm-hmm. not going to uh, immunize people. Well, so in the last few years, the uh, ability to construct a protein that is like the natural protein yeah. has been developed. And uh, those proteins, so-called prefusion proteins, are dramatically better in immunizing people. And yeah. so uh, the, the picture... You know, going back 60, 70 years, people were trying to develop vaccines against respiratory syncytial virus even then and failing. And now we have at least three candidate vaccines that look great and that are likely to be licensed or you know, one or two of them likely to be licensed in the near future. So this is dramatic yeah. that the, the realization that structure matters. Uh, has uh, uh, enabled a lot of advances. Uh, that also applies to one of my favorite viruses. <laughs> that is to say, a virus that I've been working on for many years, cytomegalovirus, yep. which is, uh, the, since rubella has been solved, uh, CMV is now the most important uh, cause of congenital infection. Uh, that results in abnormal, uh, inf- uh, that is infants with abnormalities, serious abnormalities, uh, mental, uh, physical, and, and so forth. Um, we, we now have the ability to produce CMV proteins that are likely to be a lot better, a lot more protective than the ones we've been playing with that have been, that have been maybe 50%. Uh, affected. So once again, that knowledge of structure has made a huge difference mm-hmm. uh, in uh, in making uh, proteins that are natural proteins, not just you know something pr- produced in the laboratory that's approximately uh, like the natural protein. Um, so. Um, so structural biology is has been an, an important uh, uh, advance, um, and uh, I w- I would say that 
um, the ability to um, to work out why a particular agent, virus, or bacteria is causing disease uh, is is also a key point. In other words, uh, that if you want to uh, prevent the disease by using a vaccine, you you need to know how does the 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 agent, the virus or bacteria cause disease. What what are the molecules that are actually causing the the symptoms? Right. And um, uh, particularly for bacteria, that's been an important advance because bacteria, you know, are much more complicated than viruses and many more uh, proteins. And figuring out which ones are important uh, is 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 not not always uh, easy. So um, something called reverse vaccinology has been developed. That is where uh, people take apart the genome of a bacteria and test parts of the genome to determine which are the parts mm-hmm. of the genome uh, producing the proteins that are important because the bacteria, you know, is producing uh, many, many uh, proteins, uh, right. many more than, than viruses. And uh, judging which is the important one is, is not always been easy. So I would say those are the major developments uh, currently in, um, in vaccines. Excellent. And it just... Uh... Stan, the uh, we'll put the link in, in the bio of the show. So the new institute is the European Plotkin Institute for Vaccinology. And I was just I was wondering, are you doing? I mean, are you contemplating doing anything? As you mentioned, sort of, you know, the God forbid, the next coronaviruses that I guess most people believe are going to be coming at some point, um, and, and spillover events and so forth. Are you doing anything on the animal vaccine front? Because I know there's a lot of chatter going on about you know if we could just vaccinate the intermediary species at some point uh like they did for this uh, was the example this uh this hendra virus where they vaccinated all the horses and stopped the transmission there anything interesting on the animal vaccine in front of you purely working on the human side there well uh, yes uh, the vaccines too will be working on human uh viruses and um you know you're you're, you're making an important point in that um, we are not that separate from animals, and um, we we need. Uh, I, I I totally agree that we need to know more uh, about uh, veterinary diseases, and um, uh, because of course veterinary diseases uh, can become human diseases. HIV, for example, was originally a disease of chimpanzees. Right. And so, uh, yes, I mean, unfortunately, I have no expertise in in the area of veterinary vaccinology, but uh, I uh, understand completely the the importance of knowing what is circulating in um, in animals, because of course uh, we are close in many ways to animals that is we live close uh, to animals and um, that has been important in africa and uh, important in um in asia uh and uh you know we, even uh, in, in this country uh, aside from domestic animals uh, people do have contacts with other types of animals deer are ubiquitous certainly oh, yeah. where i live oh yeah <laughs> and, um, they they carry they carry agents um yeah. uh, lyme disease is actually an, an example lyme disease is basically a yeah. uh, infection of animals right. but we get in the way and uh, so um um yeah we we definitely definitely need uh, more uh, uh, knowledge of uh, infections in, in animals, and I 
would certainly welcome more veterinary institutes uh, that study in, in infections. As far as coronaviruses are concerned, however, there's, there's no way we're going to vaccinate all the bats. Sure. Uh, so, you know, that's something we have to deal with in another way. Right. Um, Stan, uh, last month, uh, December 2022, uh, you wrote a commentary in uh, BMJ Global Health. The world needs to prepare now to prevent a polio resurgence post-eradication. Um, I just got to ask, you know, if you could say, uh, as somebody that hung out with Jonas Salk and Hillary Kaprowski and, you know, <laughs> that entire group uh, that, you know, got rid of this thing. What the hell is going on <laughs> in 2022 with it showing up in New York well, City? So this is a, a controversial uh, issue. And I know I'm going to be blunt, but I just want to say at the beginning that there are other opinions and I respect those uh, other opinions. But, um, well, I, I should specify that the prevailing opinion is to use as much oral live oral polio vaccine as possible, vaccinate everybody, uh, you know, not only vaccinate them, but vaccinate them 10, 12 times to uh, try to er eradicate uh, polio. And to some extent, that has been a successful approach. That is, um, we no longer have... Uh, all of the three uh, serotypes of of polio cir circulating um, natural uh, viruses uh, circulating. However, we still have wild polio yeah. in Afghanistan, particularly, uh, which sometimes breaks out, and we have the mutants of the oral polio vaccine that are circulating and causing polio on occasion. And the the, the thing that people have to understand that the, the concept is that polio, of course, is ca caused by the polio virus. But uh, at the worst, um, there's one case of paralysis for a couple of hundred infections. So the point is that the, the paralytic disease is obviously the result of an infection of a human with the virus, mm -hmm. but there are hundreds of other people being infected with that virus if there's a case of polio. Right. So um, a case of paralysis is a signal that you have extensive circulation of a polio virus. And the problem today is that most of the polio viruses that are circulating are the derivatives of the oral polio vaccine, the live oral polio vaccine, mm -hmm. which um, uh, Albert Sabin developed, right. which I worked on a... a uh, uh, an, um, uh, oral polio vaccines my, myself way back in, in the 60s. Uh, and they have succeeded in, in um, almost eliminating wild polio. But the fact is that we still have cases of paralysis, mm -hmm. including the one in, in New York City uh, recently. And so uh, I think, and many others think, that we the approach that we've taken over which has now been going on for what 20 30 years mm -hmm. um really should be changed that that we are generating more polio viruses than we're preventing mm -hmm. the case of polio in new york city is an example of a um, case of polio 
by a vaccine virus, a deriv derivative of a vaccine virus, in an individual who, for religious reasons, stupid religious reasons, was not vaccinated. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we and I and others, but not everybody, uh, but we believe that there should be a wider use of the killed uh, and activated polio vaccine mm -hmm. to protect people against polio, regardless of whether it's caused by the wild virus or by the, uh, by the, the, the mutated uh, vaccine virus. And uh, we think it's reprehensible that at the moment more polio is being caused by the vaccine than by the natural virus mm -hmm. um and of course the opposing view is that well let's you know vaccinate vaccinate until there's no more wild virus well mm -hmm. that's a great idea but in in the in the interim we're causing a lot of polio so this is a controversy Right. Uh, and I want to emphasize that what I just said is not necessarily the majority opinion, mm -hmm. but my opinion and the opinion of, of some other experts um, uh, who are we, we are actually we have an article that's going to come out soon okay. uh, uh, arguing this way. Excellent. Um. So one more thing I just wanted to ask about while I have you. Um, you know, a couple of months ago, um, you wrote an article in Vaccine um, Journal uh, called The Scourge of Vaccine Falsification. Um, and here you wrote this with um, uh, oh. an organization called the, the Pan-African Organization to Fight Against AIDS. Um, it's interesting because I, I had a, a guest on from a, a French organization called the Brazzaville Foundation. It was more focused on sort of small molecule falsification and 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 uh, counterfeit drugs and things of that. What's going on in, in the vaccine? I mean, is this a you say it's a growing phenomenon? But it, how how big a phenomenon is this? And um, you know, because you highlight a couple of different cases from around the world where it's been happening in the last few months. But what are you seeing? And well, you know, I, you know I, the question you ask is is a, a difficult one because sure. obviously people who are making false vaccines are not advertising them. Of course. So, you know, we don't know uh, how widespread it is. But um, I, I should say that that article was stimulated by a European uh, colleague. Uh, but But the problem... Uh, seems to be mostly in Africa, mm -hmm. uh, where um, from the economic point of view, uh, if you can make something that's supposedly cheap, uh, it still um, is, you know, generating a lot of money. And, and so apparently, reprehensible people are, are trying to produce what looks like vaccine um, and and uh, selling it to, to people. Um, uh, w one way of, in a way, getting around this uh, is, is the following, that, um, you know, when again going back you know as, as an old guy uh when i first started vaccine production was essentially um uh, companies in uh europe and north mm -hmm. america and that was it uh over the years um vaccine production has widened and this is an extremely important point that we now have vaccine production going on in Latin America, mm -hmm. in uh, and in Asia, um, and uh, focusing on Asia, we now have multiple Chinese companies producing vaccines. We have giant companies in India producing vaccines, Indonesia, Vietnam. Uh, the world has changed. 
in that vaccine production uh, in uh, the developing world is now a major um, phenomenon. Unfortunately, that has not extended to Africa. But fortunately, we now have the beginning of a vaccine institute, uh, which I believe is will be located in, in South Africa, or maybe Zambia. But anyway, uh, a real um, uh, effort to develop, develop a vaccine production institute in, in Africa. Now, when that comes online, that's going to uh, change the picture in that mm. cheap vaccines uh, will be available in, in Africa. And that will plug the hole that we have now, uh, which has been plugged in Asia, fortunately, mm -hmm. but but not, not in Africa. So... Um, this is a very fortunate uh, development, and I think uh, ultimately is going to solve the financial difficulties that uh, Africans have in getting vaccines. Excellent, excellent. Stan, while while I have you, uh, you know, you mentioned some new papers coming out. Uh, anything else hot for twenty twenty three and Stan Plotkin that we should know about? Uh, other conferences or places you're going to be presenting, um, any other initiatives that I missed, please uh, take us on the way out. Well, you know, one unsolved problem is HIV. Oh, yeah. And um, there, there is a, um, I don't know, as, as you, you know, and I'm sure your listeners know, um, all previous trials of HIV vaccines have failed. Um, well, maybe with one exception, but that may have simply been a statistical thing. Anyway, um, there, there, there is a potential new vaccine uh, coming out of the University of Massachusetts, uh, which uh, I think i mean i'm certainly hopeful that that will get into clinical trial um, the idea being that previous vaccines have been unable to cope with all the variants of, mm -hmm. of uh, hiv but this one may uh, be broader in that respect um, so uh, the lack of an hiv vaccine has been uh, a, uh, a real hole in uh, our armament, armamentarium. Um, mm -hmm. After all, we've had HIV now for what, 40 years or so? Yep. And um, no progress has been made. So um, I, I'm doing what I can to get this new vaccine into clinical trial. And uh, let's hope that it uh, that it works. Outstanding, outstanding, Stan. It's it's always uh, it's great to talk to you and 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 get your thoughts on all these matters. Hear about what you're doing, um, and just really wishing you the best with as you continue to uh, to lead this area forward into the future of vaccinology. <laughs> um, uh, for everybody, again. Uh, that's going to be listening to this particular episode of our show or watching on the YouTube channel. Again, you've been listening to the amazing Dr. Stanley Plotkin, a Professor Emeritus, Pediatrics, University of Pennsylvania, Emeritus Appointment at the Worcester Institute. Check out, and we'll have it in the link to the uh, the bio of the show, the European Plotkin Institute for Vaccinology. Um, Stan, I want to thank you again for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us for a little while. Obviously, thank you for everything you continue to do. And as we like to say on our show here, you know, thank you for helping to create a better tomorrow for so many people via the Waker deal. Really, really great hearing from you. Thank you very much. Good seeing you, Stan. Bye.